I know that it seems like you're taking a longer path. I know that it seems like everybody around you is successful and getting married and buying houses and nice cars and you're still renting a dilapidated place and keep investing in the journey to know yourself. Ignore the noise around you. The grass might look greener and it might even be greener today, but it might not be green tomorrow for everybody around you. Welcome to Building Bigfoot, the podcast about growing yourself and your business profitably. So Todd Embley is a super cool guy, very rad. Uh, He met his wife in China, and he spent about eight years working in business in China and has a very cool background there. Uh, I met him in uh, after that. He'd come back to Kelowna and was very much tackling the tech uh, scene from an energy in a way that I hadn't really seen before, especially where in our community. And it was really cool to watch, really cool to be a part of and see that. And since then, obviously, Todd, you are a business mentor, you are a VC, you are all these things, but you've also done a lot of stuff that is kind of, uh, I'd say, countercultural or counter um, intuitive. You know, you obviously do a lot of property investment, which is great. And then recently, you and your wife took over a windows and doors business, a very like good windows and doors business that's flourishing in uh, Vernon. And uh, yeah, so why don't you quickly introduce yourself? You're a fascinating human. And uh, and I'd love to get more into that as we go through. And then, um, but yeah, start, introduce yourself. And, and why would a tech VC go into a windows and doors company? All right. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm honored to be on the, on the podcast. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, we go back many, many years now, so that's cool. Um, you know, the 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 story is long uh, and twisty. It has a lot of turns and a lot of adventures along the way. China was certainly uh, a big one. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I was there, say, 2008 to 2016. Uh, It was an incredible time uh, to be there, very fortunate to be there, you know, at a time to get into tech and get into joining a fund and standing up Asia's first accelerator program for startups, a la Y Combinator, you know, Y Combinator and and, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Techstars and, and, you know, all those, the the ilk of those, Uh, you know, the iPhone comes out in 2007, right, smartphones, and now you have access to the internet in the, in the palm of your hand and you watch a billion people uh, get on the internet in one country over the course of those early years. I mean, it was just such a fascinating time to, to be there. As you mentioned, uh, I met my wife. Um, we got married. We had both kids over there. Uh, I tried starting up a couple of things. I, I started my first podcast out there uh, in 2015 kind of start, uh, called the China Startup Pulse. and you know, we, we, we just had a fascinating ride. We were doing a magazine and, and trying to get into media and advertising over there, which isn't the smartest thing for, for foreigners to do over there, which I realized much later. Um, pretty difficult. Uh, and then, yeah, bounced over to uh, San Francisco. I was running the longest running co-working space in San Francisco called Parasoma. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore, though. Uh, but that was super fun. Um, you know, just got to get it going downtown San Francisco all the time. We were very close to the Twitter building and had a good time there, but it wasn't long. We didn't really kind of, I think, mesh well um, with how expensive that city can be. Uh, and it's it's a bit of a difficult place. And I was still a foreigner, you know, so and so was my wife. And, and so it was still that rolling the boulder uphill as far as being an expat, uh, especially when we wanted to get into something like real estate. Um, and so that 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 just kind of made us want to leave early. So so we only stayed there nine months and came back, like you said, to, to Kelowna. And, you know, jumped in and got connected and did some, you know, workshops at uh, AO and then, you know, met uh, Colab and uh, Shane and, and uh, got, got really invested over there and started doing more work with them and doing some some different workshops and, and uh, you know, stuff over there. I, I joined Founder Institute uh, as a director. We kind of were re-standing up Founder Institute. And then when we went 
more virtual. We expanded and kind of geofenced all of Western Canada because the only other one in Canada was out of Toronto. Well, there was also Montreal as well. So we just kind of, like I said, took half the country uh, and ran that for a couple of years. And then I jumped in a friend of mine that I had met through SendGrid and then Twilio acquired SendGrid. So then he was part of Twilio and he had gone over to Agora, which was a real-time engagement software platform. Uh, and and then we wanted to start the, he, he wanted to start a startup program there uh, and brought me in. So we did that for a couple of years. But all that while investing in real estate, and like you said, we started buying properties in Vernon. So we came out here and then the opportunity kind of came up and it was through a property that we had bought that we were doing all the windows in. And we met this, this really amazing salt of the earth couple who owned KV Fairglass. And they had been talking about ready to retire. They had it for 47 years and wanted to get out. And we, you know, there, there was a lot of factors involved, including kind of the, the tech kind of depression uh, where, you know, stocks and, and how well tech companies were doing and COVID happened. And we just thought it'd be a good time to make the change. So wanting to be closer to real estate, you know, maybe one arm's length from real estate, being in the windows and doors company uh, business made a lot of sense. And then not traveling as much. My kids are 10 and 12 now. They're grade six and grade seven. And, you know, I heard this quote that you get 19 years with your kids 18 while they live at home, and then one total year for the rest of your lives after that. And that really kind of hit <laughs> home with me. So yeah. I I just really, you know, for the next eight, 10 years, want to be as present and as around them as possible. And I was getting the itch to jump in. And, and I guess you can't say that I started the company, but we have done everything different and a complete rebranding and... um you know, there was assets that came with the old company, but we've had to build all new websites and, and do everything new. So um, it's been quite the adventure since. And, you know, we started that in April. Yeah, that's very cool. It's very exciting. I So I recently did a renovation and uh, by recent, like four years ago, I, I did a big renovation and uh, our windows and doors here are all these um, wooden windows and doors. And so uh, I went to a company locally and I had... Uh, great experience, but I actually really enjoyed the process. I really enjoyed the process of um, buying uh, and shopping for windows and doors because when you get a good uh, like door or and it slides well, it's, it's a nice feeling and you know it's going to last for a long time. And it's funny because I remember uh, my folks, they did a... So actually, like many years ago, I used to work as a carpenter. And so I actually built my, my folks' house. And... Um, we and and I didn't order any of the the products, but I did the um I, I built the whole thing and mm. I remember we installed these uh, windows and doors and they got this really expensive sliding door system that didn't work at all and uh, <laughs> the uh, nowadays I think they've solved it where like you can you can take a really heavy door and you can push it with one finger but at the time that just wasn't very um, effective. And so we, we we installed this door and you couldn't, you just like, you'd push with all of your strength. And that was something I didn't really want to repeat. So I remember going in this, this um, yeah, experience and just like, when you're looking for windows and doors, it's not just like, how does it look? You know, what's the energy rating? But it's what, you know, how does that affect your life from a day to day? Because if a door is really heavy, you're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. And if you have something that you're hoping is going to create a great entertainment space, well, you want it to be there to enjoy it with everybody. And so I, it's a funny thing, but it's a really important to the quality of life a person's going to have. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what, so dive lower, more into your own, fr like, like, like frame, yeah, the framework that you were operating with when you were looking at this um, business, maybe. And what were some of the things that you saw immediately is like, okay, this is, you know, I come from a tech world and I see things from a different way. How could we implement those into this business? Yeah. So, you know, the way we, we saw an opportunity and we love the product. Uh, so we're a dealer for Milgard uh, and we're only doing Milgard right now as we figure out everything else. 
And so it had a great name. It had uh, quite the tenure in Vernon. They had put in most of the windows, I'd say, in Vernon, especially residentially over the years as they, 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 they went through the process where it was wood and then there was some aluminum and then they got into vinyl and, you know, and whatnot. They used to make trusses. They had dabbled in some different businesses as well. They had employed upwards of 135 plus um, people at one time. So they were fairly substantial in the area. And, and, and again, you know, bringing us closer to, being in real estate, getting connected to contractors and developers and real estate agents and, um, you know, getting to further spend, to, to take a, more of our day to spend understanding everything from permits and code and, you know, the, the permit process and the land titles that the city and just everything, which is where we were most interested in being closer to. And, you know, this was, a, this was just, I just saw an opportunity because I could see where building materials industry was going. Um, I also saw that there was a ton of problems. And so, like you said, we, I've always done things a little bit differently. So I love it when an industry has a lot of problems because I fancy myself as a bit of a fixer and a problem solver. So where everybody else might be struggling, that's just an opportunity where if you can just kind of hustle and grind it out and fix those problems, then you can win where everybody else is losing. And so, you know, customer service, good old blue collar, um, you know, showing up and working hard and doing a good job and putting the customer first and making sure that they, every single customer would be willing to give you a five-star review. Hiring is also a big problem. Um, Trades um, are very, very difficult. Uh, it's it's difficult to hire. They're difficult to find. Uh, you know, so that's that's a really you know difficult part of it. And then, like you said, my my tech background, they were very archaic in everything that they were doing. So from CRM to social media to their website, even just the the Google business behind the scenes stuff, um, I thought that we could bring a lot of interesting stuff to an old business and try to refresh it and make it new and that we would have a lot of opportunities now fair enough like we don't have a background in windows um i believe that my wife and i are pretty quick studies and that we could learn a lot and we spent a lot of time with the previous owners i mean they were coming in full time four months after we we bought the company uh and we loved it and we encouraged it there was so much information um and education locked inside their brains that we were trying to get out all the time. And we still encourage them to come down as much as possible. But we can figure out the details. We can learn, we can read, we can be on site through all of our installs and learn all that along the way. What we were bringing was an understanding of business. So from a financial and an accounting and a marketing and a tech, all of those things that's what we wanted to bring in. And if we're going to be successful and grow and be able to scale, those things have to be really nailed down. And I, I know that there's some people that say, you know, hey, you, you're not a Windows expert for 20 years yourself. How can you do this? I said, well, it's about a business. Like the product is the product. We have the, the rep and the dealers and, and they can handle a lot of things. We have great installers and they know everything that needs to be done or knowing about installing a window and, and how to do it properly so that it's going to last. But if we're going to be able to support the family that we're trying to build here through everybody that works with us, um, that's going to take understanding how to build a business. And that's a difficult marriage because a lot of tradespeople are self-employed and independent contractors, but they're on tools um, all day long. And so our job is to create a really sustainable business model. And then, especially for me, my job is to go out and get future business. And we just hire and work with amazing people who are happy to work with us, showing up on time and, and all the rest of it, to operate the existing business. And so I just, you know, where I, I saw a lot of people having issues, because I'd done a ton of renovations, obviously, in the properties we've had. And we've really, really struggled with tradespeople. Uh, over that time. And so I saw an opportunity to say, hey, why don't we dive in and see if we can't do
do a better job and bring old school customer service reliability, dependability, and, and somebody who's always available for a, a text or a call if anybody has any questions or any problems and we jump on and fix them. So yeah, it was uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. No, it, it makes so much sense because uh, sometimes we'll get stuck a little bit in the weeds where we'll think, okay, well, maybe I'm not qualified for this. But if you've been you know, working on businesses, you realize there's a lot of cross-pollination yeah. between what makes and drives a successful business in any one business if you can take the principles that are helping one, you can apply it to another, and you'll see um, a lot of success as a result. Yeah. What was the transition like? Um, how did you transition it? Obviously, it sounds like the prior owners they did a great job of um, you know they kept coming around for four months, which is amazing. Um, what was it like for the team, and how did you, you 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 do that? How did you help that process along so that everybody kind of felt like this was the next step? Um, you know, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. So just within yourself and, uh, you know, within our family, cause obviously my wife is, is jumping into this too. So we didn't have that, you know, the partner has a stable employer employee job, um, to kind of, you know, we were both leaving and jiving into this together. So there was no fallback, uh, at, you know, financially or other. So I think the emotional roller coaster and dealing with that. And I mean, we sat there, you know, for, for at least a few months and every night we'd be on the couch, kids go to bed and we're looking at each other going, what have we done? Like, what have we done? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, um, so, you know, it, it was, you know, it's scary and it's exciting. Um, the good thing is, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit older and uh, I've been around the block a few times so it doesn't scare me as much. I feel very confident in my ability to not, I mean, I, and I don't have to know what's coming. Um, and I'm not as afraid of, of the dark anymore. I know that I have the capability and ability to figure it out. Um, and then even in, on the odd case that I can, I can always apologize um, and try to, you know, learn from it. And so there's nothing but upside. And so, so we kind of got through that as a couple and, um, you know, as the owners from that point of view, um, one of the things that we did with the previous owners was we, uh, because they were in a hurry to get this done as much as we were, um, we got them to do seller financing, which was key. Uh, we didn't have to go to the banks. We didn't have to, to deal with any of that. And we were able to expedite the process a lot quicker. So that was really helpful. And I think everybody was was really excited. Uh, I think for probably a decade, they really hadn't done other thing, anything other than just kind of wait for customers to come to them. And you know, a new energy and more opportunity, and um, potentially just better processes that help internally for for everybody that that works with us that they're mm -hmm. a little more clear, a little more understanding. We do every week, you know, we do two hour team meetings and we put everything on the board, including financials. And we walk through where everything is at, where everything is going, what's coming in, what's going out, what's getting invoiced, where we're at on marketing, where we're at on sales, um, right down to, you know, money in the bank and, you know, running it very transparently and letting everybody be a part of the process. Uh, we had a real estate investor friend of ours who had seen what we'd done with other real estate and properties. She came in. So there was even the process of, of getting that 50 page shareholder agreement set up and, and stood up for our first investor to come in and buy into the company as well. And she's been a big part of it. You know, Kate and I are very aware that as a couple who own the business, we could be susceptible to groupthink and maybe have a lot of just biases and blind spots. That, that we're not aware of. So we wanted to have somebody with skin in the game who was at a different set of eyes and a different way of looking at, at things and a different background. Um, and of course, her connections and network and everything being a, a longtime real estate agent here in town as well. Um, we wanted that. Um, and so it's it, it hasn't been that difficult from a point of view of having any resistance or difficulties kind of meshing in. Um, I think we've just tried to be very open, very transparent, and not 
so that nobody feels like they're operating in the dark of not knowing where things are going to go. We're very, very open and, and we communicate all the time with everybody. Yeah, that it, it's such an interesting time to even get to talk to you about this because it is such a, um, you know, it's a transition, your, your transition, your life's transition, transitioning. Like you said, it's a, um, you know, you have other investments, but still, as far as like new income coming in, this is, this is now the entity. Mm-hmm. And so there's that stress. And you said like, it's, what have we done? <laughs> but then you're also bringing what sounds like a really, um, you're, you're bringing what would be maybe more common in the, in the technology um, provider sector where it's like, hey, let's be transparent as a team. Here's what we're doing this week. Where's like, where's every department at? Where's the business at? Where's the company's financial statement at? Um, that's got to be really cool for, yeah. for most of the team. And setting it's not goals. they've ever would have seen. Like I'm setting goals. We've got short-term goals. I've got goals for next week. And I've got stretch goals. Um, and even I'm putting out there. So are you doing OKRs then? Or are you doing your own version? Our own version. Our own version. We're not there. I don't think we're big enough uh, where OKRs specifically make sense yet as far as really kind of loading it into uh, going that far with it. But, you know, we, it, and there's no shortage of things I want to get done. Um, I'm, you know, the list is always too long. I've always failed on achieving half of what I'm trying to get done, right? Because <laughs> it just happens. And then you get a bunch of customers call and then you're out, you know, either you're doing a sales call and a quote and a measure and, and all these things. So it just, your, your time gets hijacked. Um, but I mean, part of that, you know, OKRs, anybody who's done OKRs knows that you should never hit hundred percent of your OKRs and you set bad OKRs. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of like that. It's it's a similar process. Um, Kate was very familiar with OKRs. Um, yes, I would imagine. And and so from like, what does your hybrid model look like? Um, you know, stretch goals like like I want to um, you know get a blog out you know next week, which is something I can do in a week. So kind of the weekly goals, and then. You know, we have sales targets that we want to hit every month. So what does that look like? And what are we what are we gonna do? Do we want to like make some flyers, canvas a neighborhood? Do we want to run a promotion? Uh, you know, do you know things that kind of take more or weekly things uh to to hit the monthly goals. Uh and then stretch goals can be anywhere from six months to two years. And you know, that is like one of the stretch goals for us is that we want to buy our own building. Right. As a company, that's just something we want to do. We want to get into a commercial real estate. We want to have our company buy its own building and then potentially something that has some other space that we can rent out. Similar to, you know, buying a property where you have an income suite that is absorbing, you know, hopefully a lot of your mortgage. So that takes the pressure off of what you're paying to, to live in the house. Um, we don't want to be paying rent, um, to anybody. We'd, we'd rather be paying rent to ourselves. And so. Uh, there's some structural things on long-term yeah, goals, right? That, that that makes a lot of sense. I I I love I love how you just explained that. I think from a uh, from a goal setting standpoint, this is a model that I think most businesses, any business, could probably apply, even if you're doing OKRs. Which is, you know, because OKRs sometimes forget about what what needs to happen this week. Yeah, and because they're they're always thinking about okay, what needs to happen for the end of the quarter, and the so if you have to say like this is what my weekly objectives are, and I know what my my monthly goals are going to be, and then I know if I can achieve this and this and this, that's going to be pretty exciting for the business. It's going to be exciting for um, everyone overall. But it's a stretch goal. Then you're you're it's a great hybrid. I, I like that, and I also think it makes sense from like one of your stretch goals being owning your own business because. Um, recently I was talking to some pe- people about this exact thing, actually last week when I was in Victoria and the, uh, and it was a, such an interesting case study because there were two businesses, one business owned their own office building from, um, and the other business didn't. And, um, one of the businesses margins was essentially eaten up by the fact that they were kept facing raising, uh, costs of rent, rent. and the other business was fine because their their costs were essentially uh, stable and they and then over time their revenue was increasing so they were in a totally different position 
And long story short, one business is now out of business just because they weren't able to keep up with the rising cost of rent. And they were in prime locations, both of them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was, that's, that's really interesting. Steve and I, we actually, we, we bought the building that we're in as well. And I, I, so I totally get the, um, the philosophy there well, as it's, a business. Uh, so there was a couple of things that even helped us realize how important that was. Uh, one was when we met and where we bought the windows from when they were in their original office, they had sold the whole building that they actually owned. And the new owners uh, like tripled the rent. And then they had to move out of the building they used to own. Um, and I actually helped source the, the commercial space that they, they moved into just in, before we'd even really kind of started talking. Um, we actually helped them even move, lifting everything and stuff like that. And, um, cause they're just so sweet. Um, but you know, listening to a lot of other podcasts as well, you know, like the commercial real estate podcasts that, uh, the guys out of Vancouver and stuff like that. And one of the guys that was on there, um, his family used to own AMB sound and AMB sound is wildly successful still to this day. Has anybody seen an AMB Sound uh, retail outlet in 20 years? No, like they're they're not. One of the reasons AMB Sound continues to be successful today, although not called AMB Sound, is that everywhere they were across Canada, they own their own building. And so they uh-huh. owned all their own real estate. Now they're a commercial real estate company. Um, but they were able to do that and withstand kind of the economic and and industry changes that were going on where they just couldn't keep up for whatever reason. They just kind of moved out. Best Buys came in, but they were still able to be wildly successful because of focusing on being real estate. And there's kind of that that famous quote uh, from the founder of McDonald's. I think he was talking to uh, you know a, a university group in, in Dallas or, or at Stanford or something. And after his talk, I think he said that they went for drinks and he asked the group, what do you think our business is? What business do you think McDonald's is in? And somebody raised their hand and said, well, hamburgers, obviously. And he said, no, we're a real estate company. And so I think I've always remembered that and I'm trying to focus on that as well. Um, And just, you know, I can't emphasize the importance of team. Our accountant, our lawyer, our broker, um, everybody that we work with is very high end and I've been through many. I wasn't afraid, like I, I went through, I like our accountant now, Kyle Britton, who's amazing. And I'll, I'll drop his name here. Cause I think he's great. He's with Clark Robinson. Um, he gets it. He's in the industry. He likes to invest. He likes real estate and he sees all things. And he's always the one asking me questions, not the other way around. And he was the fourth accountant that I landed on when we moved here. So I was just every year, I was moving to a different one, different, different one until I found the right fit and the right, kind of the right person. And so, I mean, I, I think building a brilliant team around you is, mm-hmm. is key as, as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that principle on the, on the real estate thing, just as well. Just, uh, just another anecdote, mm. the building right behind us is it still has the signage on the back it was Kelowna's very first uh, real estate office. Mm. And I, interestingly enough, the family that started that real estate um, company still owns that building. And I think, I, I want to say they're, on their, they're, they're moving into their fourth generation now, and they still own that same building. It doesn't do that. It, like, it's not a real estate office yeah. anymore. It's something else. But, the, um, but it's, it's just interesting. Yeah. And so it, it, all, it all goes back. Yeah. So And the other thing is, uh, as you'll, you know, as you know, uh, a, a business like a healthy business becomes a vehicle for growth in many other ways, and so it's it gets very very exciting. Yeah, and that has to be structured properly, right? Like I think yes. a good tip up front is in you know our lawyer really kind of helped us out with this is that we knew to kind of do some 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 structure steps, right, and have have a, a higher level holding company, and then create a subsidiary, and then that subsidiary bought you know, KT Fairglass. And even for me, I've thought, you know, why not move all our installers? And I'll create a, a, a secondary company that is an installation company that then I can pretty much subcontract to myself for installation. There's some nice legal liability delineation between the two as well, where I can protect 
you know, the windows and doors from liabilities that come from installation per se, uh, or vice versa. Um, and then I can actually then take that installation company and I've had builders come and say, listen, are you open to installing not just your own stuff, but for other people? So I know that now builders and developers are struggling. Either they don't like the way their own guys install windows, or they don't have qualified people to install the windows in their bigger developments. Maybe you're doing like a 40, you know, maybe a spec house neighborhood or something like that. Um, they're not experts at installing windows, but maybe if we had a side business that was an insula- windows and doors installation business, we could actually get a lot of work, even if it wasn't related to the products that KT Fairglass actually sells. And and I think just kind of starting to understand and think through all that. But again, having a great team, then you don't have to be as for a thing. You don't have to sit there and listen to this podcast and think, shit, I never thought about that. Like, that's that's really smart. Well, I didn't have to either because I had a really good team and people brought those ideas to me. Yeah. The the fact is, is that business, the business usually generates ideas and you start to, you know, see other um, other opportunities in the market pretty quickly, and you're solving problems essentially. I love the fact that even as you started, you talked about the fact that you get excited when you see problems. Other people might get kind of, you know, maybe they're facing the same problem and they're not quite sure how to solve it, and so then they start to feel that grind or the mental fatigue. But you get excited mm. by that, so that's obviously one of your big your big core strengths. Um, in in the business, so it sounds like right now what you're working on from from uh, like in the short term is it sounds like SEO. So inbound. And are you going after uh, reviews as well? Is that something that you're, yeah. cause you mentioned that a bit at the beginning. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, you know, now that we're, uh, you know, it took a while, you know, we had to build the website. Um, we had to get our socials at least stood up. Um, and now we're actually partnering with Castanet who has an, a, a side arm business of running social and so we've actually just had our first meetings with them last week. I dallied with doing it myself. And then I brought in, you know, like a young high school graduate. Uh, I said, hey, come hang around. You want to be an entrepreneur? Come hang out in our office. Listen to the way Kate and I philosophize about everything to do. And I'm not sure that's even a word, but um, about, you know, how to build a company in the way we think, you know, it's a great way for you to just be around people who are entrepreneurial and absorb everything you can. That didn't really work out. And so now it's, it's more like going going with them. And so we are kind of um, standing that up, uh, websites up. Took a little while with the Google backend because we had changed the brand. Um, Google needed to go through a lot of verification. Um, obviously, the phone number and the address and, and everything is the same. So we, what Google will do is amalgamate all the reviews and everything into the new name. So all the reviews, not... <laughs> all the reviews, all, all seven of the, re- <laughs> six of the reviews from the previous company, they came with, um, once we got stood up. And so, um, but yes, now, and I've started to understand just from being out and, and talking to customers, uh, all the time. I mean, they used to be this famous myth about Jack Ma once a month putting on, you know, clothes and, and going and delivering, you know, packages for Alibaba. Um, or for Taobao or whatever, um, just so he could meet and talk to customers and still keep, you know, feet on the ground and, and feel like he has a connection to the actual customers. And so doing that a lot and, and just getting feedback, understanding how important Google reviews are for a business like ours, because so they, important. they, they look at those through and through. Um, and there's certainly certain things I want them to be talking about, which is attacking. And if they can, if you love these parts of our business, please don't be please try to mention that because this is what everybody is struggling with. And if we're doing this well, and this is our aim is to do this really, really well, then, you know, it's communication. I think setting expectations and communication is so key. I think cost variables mm-hmm. or, or things that like sometimes, you know, we'll get a window and we'll go out there and it'll break, right? Someday it'll drop or it'll get cracked or something will happen. Now we got to reorder. So now that it's three weeks added to the, to the timeline. Um, but again, you communicate, you make it up, you know, you're, you keep them abreast of everything that's going on. Um, they can be very, um, accommodating, um, if you do that, mm. but as long uh, as it's the communications proactive. Yeah. So they know that they, that you're in their court. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. over. It's a very scary thing. People are spending $20,000 on doing new windows. Yeah. 
sometimes much, much more. Uh, so yeah. it's a big purchase. Sometimes it's twenty thousand dollars for a window. <laughs> yeah, it can be. Yeah, a big yeah. bay window for sure. Yeah. And so it's it's it is it is oh those 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 accordion sliding doors right that you were talking yes, about. I mean that, those yes. are massive, uh, you Very, know, and yeah. really expensive. So. Imagine spending that kind of money, especially if you don't have all the money in the world, you're going to be very concerned. You're going to worry. You, you're going ahead with this. Okay. We're going to do it. Like, you know, and, and, and they have the, you know, and trades have such a bad rap right now. So you're worried. Are they going to show up? Are they going to be on time? Are they going to, are they going to clean up after themselves? You know, are they, you know, all these kind of things. So just trying to be there and alleviate that and help them just feel good, set the right expectations, communicate a lot. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the reviews are a big thing. We are really focused on that. And I'm trying to do some different things, some nice touches. And I'm even I'm even setting, uh, let's say, levels of follow-up. Like some people get a $25 Amazon gift card. Some people get a freaking $400 charcuterie board, right? And, and I want to send those to our clients afterwards and just say, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your business. Really appreciate it. We aim to be five star. If we were five star, we'd love a review. If not, can I call you? Can we talk about this? I need to learn. I want to grow. I know. I want to know everything that you may have been dissatisfied with in, for any reason, so that we can try to fix that for the next person. And yeah, I mean, I think just some some details, man. Details. And, you know, little things like that can go such a long way. Wow, I love that. That that is such a great philosophy. It reminds me. So I used to watch this. Um, the show where people from uh, the UK would be moving to say Spain or they're moving to uh, south of France and they open up their their uh, bed and breakfast because like a lot of people in the UK seem to have a dream of opening up a bed and breakfast somewhere <laughs> and uh, like enough that there's a TV show about it yeah and this one guy he he blew my mind because he kind of came from that same like growth philosophy the, the 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 growth mindset that you you just described and when they would have guests, not everything they did was perfect. They were brand new at bed and breakfasts, so so they they would um, they just did there was things they just didn't even think about, but their guests were thinking about it. And the very first thing he would do is he would actually see the guests because it's bed and breakfast, it's at their place mm-hmm. um, as they were leaving, and he would ask them. He'd be like, "Can you just tell me how your stay was?" But like, I like it's kind of like what he like it was different words, but essentially he was communicating. We aim to be five star. But we want your feedback and we need your feedback so that we can be five star. If there was anything we did that wasn't up to the standards, can you just let me know right now? And in it's really hard to do, especially when you have guests from the UK, because the UK's culture is about being polite. And so they don't actually want to tell you anything that might, you know, upset you or hurt your feelings. Mm-hmm. Um and but the way he asked the question, he was getting all that feedback. And you know, because he got the feedback right then and there the people felt good because they had communicated what was on their mind because so often people will go to do a review not because they um, necessarily don't like the company, but it's just, it's the one avenue where they feel like they can really voice what, you know, and feel like they're being heard. And so if you can get up front and do that, like he did a great job with this. I just remember that. And like the people weren't saying necessarily like the, they weren't giving him necessarily a five-star review yet, but he took all the feedback he would then implement it. And then the next guest he had was suddenly giving him that five-star review. And it was simple things. It was like little stuff that maybe if you'd done a like a bed and breakfast for a while, you would know, you know, without yeah. even thinking about it. People are finicky. Um, our Airbnb uh, kind of path taught us a lot of that early. That was really kind of where we really got firsthand experience because, you know, with Airbnb, you're trying to be a super host, right? That super host status is so key to showing up at the top of search results. And you get that by having a five star rating. And so we really, really went after that early. Um, again, it was kind of our, our first couple of Airbnbs and our first time. And it's a large investment and we're really kind of going for it. So it means a lot to us. So, you know, like mints on the pillows and having little snacks and, and everything is local. Everything, you know, we, we go to the refill. Uh, store for all our soaps and shampoos and things. And oh man, my um, my keep, wife would love this. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. Good. You, you keep keep yeah. it all as local as possible. You know, maps and guides and you know just all kinds of little things that are all around there. And we really kind of went with a lot of a lot of touches. And then we'd follow up and just be like, hey, you know, like we wouldn't necessarily. And I it it always feels a little bit weird 
asking for a review. So only if the, and only when I really, really know that they're super, super happy and they have glowing, nothing but glowing things to say, um, that's when I'll maybe ask. Uh, and I always feel a little, I don't know, humble about doing it or, or something. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but I asked them if they wouldn't mind because it would really help us out um, because we think we're helping people in an area where a lot of people are not. But yeah, the Airbnb, the details, it was key. Um, and it's, it was really, really important. We, and the, and the power of kind of the five star, which, you know, that's, that's where we learned that. Yeah, no, it makes so much sense. It's, it's again, it's like you're, you're, you're taking an experience from Airbnb, which is world-class when it comes to providing, um, you know, great customer service experiences. Like they've also done a really good job with their tech platform. They've made it seamless. They've really removed a lot of that friction. Um, and then you're putting that same experience now into a Windows and Doors company, which is so cool, right? It's it's um, it's a case study. Like you could uh, you, you could probably take what you're doing here and then implement it somewhere else. And so it's it's fascinating. It's it's uh, it's word of mouth. Yeah, I mean, so this much. Is, to- this is kind of small town, right? I mean, it, everybody talks, and and so much of the business that you're going to get is from people who are talking to their friends or making recommendations. Uh, I think people will openly uh, talk about how unhappy they are with their windows or the draft or the cold or the the mold or whatever, the, you know, moisture on the windows and the inside during the winter, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just customer obsessed, just absolutely being customer obsessed. And I think, I don't think the trades industry does a great job at that. And I've heard complaints about, you know, people not showing up. Like I, I went and saw a, a guy yesterday who had a sliding glass door handle that wasn't working. And he called me out and he said, two months ago, somebody came from this company and they took the door handle and said that they'd bring me a new one and come back. I cannot get a hold of them. They won't <laughs> return my call. I don't actually have a handle on my sliding glass door. Oh, out to no. the pool. Uh, and it's not even a product that we that we own, but I'm, you know, in the process of, of sourcing it for him and 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 bringing that that back in but um it is it is it is difficult and and i get it like there's economics at play because people are getting astronomic quotes because they only want to do one window well yeah some companies are going to actually price you out of getting their your business they don't they almost don't want you to accept the quote because it's not worth it for them to pack up all the tools and everything and travel and all the costs included with that to go and do one window that might take a couple hours to install you know, the profit margin doesn't offset as well as doing a big job and taking the tools and setting up once and being there for a week. So, you know, and it's difficult, but then who's going to service those people, right? Like there's a little old lady in the trailer park who, who husband has had passed and she dumped all her savings into buying this thing so she could own it and live there for the rest of her days. One little window on the side of her, her, her mobile home Um, and you know, it was an $1,800 quote, um, from a company who clearly was like, if you're, if, if we're doing this for you, we're going to like, we're going to, we're going to make sure that we get what, what we want out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was, yeah, I just, I kind of feel bad. I, I hope to be able to maintain this with no job is too small, um, kind of attitude. Um, I, I really kind of hope to be able to, to, to keep that going. That's so cool. That's a good culture. I, I think that, um, you, you know, part of it is integrity too, because like, you know, for somebody like that scenario you just described, they may not know that that's a, that's a high quote, mm. you know? So, so they're not going somewhere else to ask a different quote. They're just, they might just move ahead, but that money might be their entire month's planned savings income. Yeah. And you know that that to me is um, yeah it, it's a, it's it's that it comes down to sort of an integrity of practice that then becomes contagious because it slowly it takes time mm-hmm. for culture to change it gets picked up by other people. There's a industry. certain amount of work that we want to do that I would say would be like pro bono. You know, like lawyers, you know, have to do a certain amount of pro bono work or something like this. Anybody's watched Suits in the last few seasons, or you know, you saw all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And I, I just you know that. Well, I was like, you know, we will do that 100% at cost. Like, we're not going to make a dime. Um, and, 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 you know, we'll, 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 we'll only charge you what, what we pay for the window and, and what it costs us. And, and we'll come out and do it. And we're not, there's going to be no markup whatsoever. We'll just get it done. Um, but 
yeah, I hopefully, yeah, we can keep keep going like that. But I understand how other businesses. I mean, as you elevate to the second floor, the third floor, the fourth floor of your business, it's hard to stay on top of what's going on at the bottom floor, and you have to put in processes and OKRs and you know culture and a, an approach that is scalable that you know, people have to know and have that handbook uh, in their back pocket of how to handle situations and how to do quotes. And, and so you sort of preparing all of this. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, as we grow, I'm able to stay in touch and still to be able to continue the culture of like, listen, you know, let's put it in the meetings. Like, what jobs are we doing? Like, where's our, where's our 10%, 20% kind of pro bono work that we're out there just giving back to the community versus trying to make money? Yeah, that's that's interesting. It's um, it's it's a totally different um way of thinking about it. But if you can make it part of the business model, and the business model makes sense as a result, that's pretty cool. I think and there's I think just the underlying team... attributes, right? I mean, yeah, that's that's the thing. Not everything is easily drawn, you know, in the line to the bottom line, uh, right? Like as as impacting the bottom line, and not sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very it's circuitous kind of path to what is actually helping the business overall. It's not always that easy to see. Um, dollars and cents are very easy to see and track. Um, hours and, and, and you know, whatnot. It's, you can track that stuff. And other things are just, you kind of like throw it into the ethos or into the atmosphere and you just kind of hope and pray that people appreciate what you're doing and what you stand for. But there's, it's really hard to track. So, um, but I'm, I don't want that to dissuade me from doing it anyway. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Now, what like I, I love that, Todd. Like I, I know you and Kate, like no matter what you guys do, you're successful. So it's pretty cool to see. Um, and this is by itself, it's such an interesting uh thing. And I, I know I'm gonna have you on the podcast again and we can kind of keep talking about the journey because I'm sure it, it'll be such a fun thing to be a part mm. of. Um so one one of the questions that I love to ask on this podcast is sort of uh around you yourself, like uh, were, did you always know that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Is that something that you you woke up, you know, day one of life and you were just like, this is it? Or is it something that developed over time? It definitely developed over time. Um, I've heard varying opinions on whether entrepreneurs can be born or bred, uh, are born or can be bred. Um, I I do think that they can be um, bread. I think life is long and you're going to go through various iterations of who you are. I always knew I was a little bit different. Uh, I had good work ethic and that came from my dad, um, growing up. So I always knew I, I worked really hard. Um, I think, you know, having ADHD, um, you know, just kind of getting diagnosed five years ago, um, that, always gave me some superpowers as well as some some downsides um but also some differences and so i think being curious i i just was always super curious i mean working hard having grit resilience and 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 being very curious were probably looking back some key markers i didn't notice it at the time but um just kind of saw things asked different questions sometimes than i think people around me were asking and you know i just i felt like I was a little bit set apart in a way. I didn't know it would manifest into being an entrepreneur per se, but I, I just, you know, and then, and then confidence. And as I gained confidence in, like I never shied away from doing difficult things. I always chose the hard path. Um, and I'm glad that I did because it is, as I've been able to, to climb those, those mountains, taking the harder paths and I've done it multiple times. Now I'm less afraid. And now I actually relish and enjoy it. And I see now how it can lead you to be successful. And so I never shied away from it. I mean, being an entrepreneur or a sole proprietor, self-employed, whatever it is, it's really hard. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of, you know, you wake up every day uh, with a challenge in front of you um, and you only have yourself to blame by the time you go to bed for whatever, however that day shook out. So um, it can be really, really hard, but um, I think just the confidence in in that, you know what, I'm capable, I'll work hard, I'll figure it out. I don't have to, and I, I, I'm not approaching it like I have to beat everybody else. It's not about that. I only have to beat myself. 
and I have to beat the demons that live inside my own head and beat that imposter syndrome and and all those other things. That's the only challenge. It's the only the only person playing against me is myself. So I just have to continue to beat that. And and if I'm confident and I know that I'm going to do it right, I want to do it the right way and I'm good at problem solving and I don't shy away from things that are difficult and I have a bit of an appetite for risk, then yeah, let's go let's go do it. That's in, that's I love that. That's so cool. Now, are you um like if you were to go back say 20 years and you're to meet yourself Mm. Um, what would be some advice that you would give yourself then, um, that you now know today? You know, depending on the day and the time that advice can always change. But right now I think I'm the way I'm feeling is, uh, I would, I would say, I know that it seems like you're taking a longer path. I know that it seems like everybody around you is successful and getting married and buying houses and nice cars and you're still you know renting a dilapidated place and um i was on a you know keep investing in the journey to know yourself ignore the noise around you don't compare yourself you know compete with the joneses um the grass might look greener and it might even be greener today but it might not be green tomorrow um for everybody around you. And so continue to invest in yourself, invest, don't consume, stay the course, focus on continuing, continuing to know yourself, both like not, none of this would have been possible without the right partner. And I could never have landed the right partner if I didn't land myself first. So step one was if you're not where you want to be, um, keep on the path, um, and find who you are essentially, and who the essence of you is, then allow the partner to come in so that you're not bringing them into a world that isn't really you. And then that's going to solve and create a lot of synergies between you and and help your partnership grow really well. And then land the great partner. um, And then after that, you know, the support and, and, you know, just, just go forward. But it's like, it would just be like, be patient, stay the course, it's going to work out, right? Just, calm down. Don't be so afraid or, or upset or, or sad. It's hard. It's hard, right? Cause it's like, there's, there's a, uh, enthusiasm to life that I think, um, you know, I, I can share with you, which is, you know, I've seen it on you. I know I have a two where it's like, you're, you, you, you want everything to fast forward a little bit because you're so excited. Cause you know where it's going and you're like, I just want it now. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, um, but that advice is really good advice. Like, uh, and it actually, it sounds very similar to something I've, I've been hearing the last couple of weeks, uh, which is cool. But like, definitely, like you were saying, you know, stay the course, uh, work on yourself. Uh, you know, e- even that advice you just gave about, you know, finding your partner, which is, that was really profound, which is if you present yourself as you are, you're you're gonna find somebody who meets you as you are, and and it's gonna be the right fit. You don't want to come across something that you're not, and then now they're they've, they've you know they're they're forming a relationship with someone else, because then that's going to create a little bit of confusion at the beginning of a relationship for sure. Um, you so I heard I heard this analogy. I thought it was great. So this guy he uh, he loves like food, and he decided to go on a fast with no food for an extended period of time. And during this fast with no food, he bought, I think he said it was like 38 cookbooks. <laughs> I was like, why? Why would you do that to yourself? The torture. But the torture. And he was like watching these like food shows. And one of them was the, you know, the, those chef challenges where a chef would go to a restaurant or not a restaurant, but they'd be presented with all these different food groups. And you would mm-hmm. think like, how the heck are you going to make something out of this? What, what they've been given? But then they, because they're great chefs, they would put it together and they'd end up creating a meal that was so cool, so much better. And he was saying, this is like life. It's like we go through life and we end up like getting these ingredients that we look at and we're like, how the heck do these things work together? But because we had those experiences, because they're they're our experiences and they're unique, it's end up creating a platter that will be far cooler than it ever would have been had we not gone through those experiences. And he said, too often what he'll see is someone will go through an experience and they'll almost try to cut it out. But that experience is the like the most important ingredient to bring in to make the meal what it's about to be. 
and yeah. to actually embrace all the experiences that we've encountered in life, the good and the bad. I listened to, I don't know if you know who, um, you, you maybe you know Dan, Dan Martell. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he went for a, a run on this weekend. He did a 50 kilometer run, a personal challenge. He wanted to, he trained for, he wanted to do it, so he did it. Um, and he said that, what you know, that run is hard, because well, for one, he's never done before. He doesn't have the like. It's like you're 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 putting yourself through something that is incredibly painful. And as he's is doing the run, um, he was running with another guy who who basically committed to run with him for 25k, and then 25k he peels off and he's gone. So now he's by himself and he's got to run the last 25k, and it's getting harder and harder. And he said he's got a big thing about language to himself. So he said like even though he didn't feel like running, he started to tell himself all the words that would like reinforce like. Uh, you're you're capable. You're strong. Your legs are feeling good, even though they were feeling exactly the opposite. He ends up going to this like third, fourth, twentieth, whatever wind. Um, and then on the last kilometer, um, his uh, his wife and his two sons they're they're younger, um, similar age to your kids. They show up and they ran with him the whole last kilometer. And he said he was just filled with so much joy and warmth as he was completing this. But in that journey, like he said, he's like, I choose to do the uncomfortable, the hard things because he wants to grow as a person because it's in that journey of, of, of pain. He's actually starting to confront things inside of himself that, uh, that are hard, right? Because you're, cause at a certain point when you're running 50 kilometers in trails, you're going up and it's hard. Um, you, you're starting to go into a bit of survival where you're mm-hmm. fighting the, the survival of this nature. Like you, you, you know what I mean? Like, why would I kill myself? Um, and as a result, it brings up deep issues. And he said that one of the things he's learning or he's learned is that it's the most painful things he's been through in life that are actually his most powerful things that he has today. And he's like, and he's gone through some pretty hard stuff in his in his upbringing. Um, and but he's he's gone through it and he's now embraced it. And as a result, he's 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 using that to really like bless his life into the future. Um, it's it's really cool, but I, I, I it kind of goes similar to what you're saying, which is it's almost the same thing, which is just um, you know enjoy the journey. It's a journey. Uh, don't compare yourself with what someone else's journey looks like, because they're making a different fruit salad. They're making you know what I mean. They're making something different. Like your the meal that you're about to create is actually going to be a lot cooler and a lot better than than you might even know. But it's going to take all those different ingredients, mental together, and all of a sudden you have it. It's, yeah, I I, I love that. It's yeah. obviously invest in skills. Like you invest in skills. Some of those skills are resiliency, right? It's not being a yeah. a, a master website designer all the time, right? Um, some of them are internal, but I mean, and that's that's the thing. I mean, why faced with the most random set of ingredients, can you still make an incredible meal? Um, it's just because those people invested in in the skill of being an amazing chef. So they're not afraid of being faced with whatever set of ingredients are put in front of them. They know they can make an amazing meal out of anything. And and that's there's there's a solace that comes with that once you get to the point of of that confidence that allows you to enjoyably attack things that are really, really potentially uncomfortable. And, and, and it's, it's wonderful to, to kind of get there. And then you can really focus on the growth. Then, then the fears start to subside and the what ifs and the, you know, the anxieties <clears throat> all start to subside. And you can really kind of focus on, on what's coming and how it, you, you get excited for the difficulty right? Um, you get excited for the challenge. Like some people just love going to the gym because it's leg day, right? It's like, oh, it's leg day. I can't wait to go to the gym tomorrow or something like that. It's just, yeah, it's really, really hard. Those are the biggest muscles. You're going to be pushing the biggest weights in the gym that you will all week, yet you're so excited about it. Um, it's just, everybody has the different things, but you know, it's at the end of the day, life is about how many minutes of happiness were you able to enjoy today? And, um, you know, get yourself to a place where um, you're comfortably attacking things that are challenging and risky. And, um, but just make sure that you're figuring out how to continually improve those number of minutes per day. You're happy. Yeah. I love that. And how do you do that? How do you, um, 
how do you embrace those moments of of happiness? I really do think them? gratitude, right? I mean, I know it's it's almost cliche at this point. I think any yogi or anybody who meditates, uh, you know, they'll they'll understand this through and through and and know it to be true. But um, I'm, you know, I, I've been in some dark places, um, and I've had my own paths and my own demons. You know, thirty years ago, I mean, my twenties was was wrought with a lot of difficulty and substance abuse and, and, and all kinds of things. And it was really, really hard. And a lot of it was, you know, those were manifestations of what the real problem was, was me just not being happy with myself and not knowing how to handle life. Um, and so band-aids left, right and center to try to find happiness. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. Um, I think, I think if you just look around and you're like, listen, you know, even just saying like, we live in Canada, right? Or, you know, we like having kids um, are great. They're great rocks to rest on for sure. Um, those, those are always amazing. And, and I've done good things. I've accomplished. I've gone through the dark times. I've, you know what? I'm still above ground. Uh, so let's be grateful for that. I mean, a lot of people aren't and we know people that aren't. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just, you know, the ride, I'm just enjoying the ride and it's been great. I don't have to, re I, I'm not saying, or I'm not living and dying or, or validating myself by the outcomes. Um, I am more, you know, grateful to be able to impact lives and, and have people around me that I love and take care of my team and, um, help make their lives better. And, and just, just whatever it takes, just figure out how to be grateful and just push the negative thoughts away. Wow, that's so cool, Todd. Okay, is there anything like last that you'd want to, um, you know, leave leave the listener with? And then finally, like, uh, where would they be able to reach you or, or get a hold of you? Uh, I think I've, I don't know. I mean, parting wisdoms. I don't know. I think, uh, you know, if, if anybody's struggling or having difficulty, reach out. Um, I think you know, leverage, be open about it. Don't, uh, don't keep it inside. Don't hide it. Um, uh, I, when I was down, a friend of mine, Joel Seminuk, um, and, uh, out in Winnipeg, <clears throat> he told me that when I would call him and say, I'm not doing good, man. Like I'm not having a good day. I don't feel, I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about my future. I feel like I'm letting my family down something like this, whatever. Um, he, he would say, listen, he's like, call somebody up and mentor them. Your superpower is mentorship. You're an amazing mentor. Um, and if it's, if you're having trouble today dealing with your life, go somebody, go help somebody else help with theirs, um, and support them. Um, so mm. that, and so I did that. I was still driving. I got off the phone. I called somebody who I knew was kind of chasing me for some advice and things like that. And so I called them up. We had a great half an hour conversation. Um, I took the I took the spotlight off me and put it onto somebody else, and then was able to help them. And then and then I got off, and I felt good. You know, I felt great. I felt worthwhile. I felt whole. Like I had helped somebody else in their life, in their path, their journey, their company, their business. Um, feel a little bit stronger, a little bit more. Um, I don't know, positive and optimistic about the future of whatever we were talking about. And, and I called him back and I was like, man, you were so right. You were so right. I feel so much better just by helping somebody else. If I couldn't help myself today, help somebody else. So um, maybe for people can try that. And then as far as getting hold of me, I'm pretty open anywhere. I think LinkedIn is kind of still one of my, my favorite, less noisy uh, places. Um, you can just type my name in, Todd Embley, into LinkedIn. Uh, it's a great place. You can message me on there. And, uh, you know, I'd love to connect with everybody. That's awesome. Well, Todd, I know for sure that you have absolutely, well, I feel blessed listening to this. And I, and I know that whoever listened to this, there's, there's going to be nuggets that you shared. There is so much wisdom that you shared today. So much profound. There's business wisdom in here and there's life wisdom. And then there's, there's wisdom that's kind of even deeper than that. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, man. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this uh, through and through. And you're such a cool guy. I really like you. You're just a cool guy. So with that. <laughs> that doesn't come my way very often. That's not, not typically uh, 
Um, but I appreciate it, man. Thanks, John. Uh, you, uh, your brother, your whole team, uh, your family, uh, all the best to you. Uh, my wife wanted to make sure that uh, she said hi and definitely that uh, that it's long overdue that we all catch up. But thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. <laughs>